Hello, everybody. This is John Schneider. I'm the Secretary General of the GEM Foundation. Welcome to our 10th anniversary OpenQuake webinar. This webinar is an opportunity to share with all of you our achievements of the GEM Foundation uh, through the lens of our core software tool, the OpenQuake engine. I'd like to first thank our, our sponsors and partners. We have private participants or sponsors, largely from the insurance and engineering sector, public participants, largely government organizations throughout the world, project partners and international associates. And I'd like to thank all of them for contributing to help make us a success and to uh, contribute to our being able to develop the OpenQuake engine. The OpenQuake engine is the foundation of GEM's hazard and risk assessment capability. It's a hallmark of GEM's open framework and global collaboration network. It's the primary tool for the analysis of earthquake hazard and risk at all scales from local to national, regional, and indeed global. Today's webinar will look back on our achievements over the past decade review the current capabilities of the software, and also look a bit into the future where, where we'll be going in the next, uh, next few years. I'd like to first share with you a few statistics. Um, the OpenQuake Engine download page, unique visits since 2019, there've been over 12,000. Now we can't tell if these are all people downloading the engine, but it's a pretty good indication of the interest in, in the software itself. And these, um, these visits come from 139 countries. This is just in the, past, uh, in the past year. And a few, few more statistics. For OpenQuake engine related tools and data downloads, so these are the, the tools that help developers with, with, uh, develop, with uh, building uh, OpenQuake models, 920 downloads in the last year. Uh, there, there have also been over 56 contributors to the software in, in the last decade. So these are people who've actually developed code. There have been uh, approximately 80 OpenQuake engine releases. So lots of updates, lots of changes, um, and more than a thousand people trained in the software through, through, uh, through um, conferences, through workshops, uh, et cetera, over a thousand people worldwide from 90 countries. And we've identified over 450 uh, citations and papers uh, of studies that have used OpenQuake Engine for, uh, for um, analysis of earthquake hazard or risk. Um, these these uh, individuals come from over 70 countries. And moreover, the applications that they've uh, developed have been applied in 58 countries. So the studies themselves are covering a substantial part of the earthquake uh, hazard and risk in the world. I'd like to, to uh, just give you a brief um, synopsis of how we're going to approach the day. Uh, we have uh, our agenda divided into two parts. The earthquake uh, uh, hazard component will be led by Marco Pagani, uh, GEMS uh, OpenQuake, or GEMS uh, hazard, um, uh, earthquake hazard uh, team leader. He will present the past, present, and future of, of uh, the OpenQuake engine. And following that will be two presentations by hazard specialists who've been uh, working on applications of OpenQuake in the hazard domain. Then Vitor Silva will present on earthquake risk. Uh, Vitor is the uh, risk team leader for, for GEM Foundation. And uh, two presentations then will again be given by uh, again, by, by, by specialists who, who have worked on applications in other parts of the world. So that's the, that's the approach. I'd like to now invite Marco Pagani, our team leader for the uh, for Earthquake Hazard at GEM Foundation. Uh, Marco has been the, uh, in this role for, I think, uh, at least 10 years. And um, he's uh, an expert on the development of the tools as well as on, on their application. He led the development of the Global Earthquake Hazard Model. So, uh, Marco, uh, please um, invite you to the to the uh, stage, as it were, to give your presentation. Thank you, Marco. Okay. So, good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening to to everyone. And I hope uh, you can hear me well, and I hope you can see my presentation clearly. Uh, 
Um, so it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and have uh, this chance to, to uh, give you a very, a very quick tour through the uh, other component of the OpenQuake engine. And I'm going to do that uh, with Michele, Michele Siminato, who's part of the IT team and is actually the person behind the OpenQuake engine, the one that had been developing uh, 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 a very vast portion of the engine and the rest of the other team and you see the names there that uh, throughout the years uh, entered into and worked inside the other team. So uh, as you understood uh, we, we started the development of the OpenQuake engine uh, uh, in the summer 2010 and uh, actually the other component uh, of the of the OpenQuake engine uh, for the initial couple of years uh, was, uh, was OpenSHA. So we decided at that time, since we were familiar with that software, to use the OpenSHA as, as the other component. And that worked well for a couple of years. Uh, um, but uh, the, the OpenQuick engine, as you know, is developed in Python, while OpenSHA is developed in Java. And, uh, and uh, after a while, it became clear that it was very difficult to maintain a software with this combination of two different programming languages. So in 2012, we started the implementation of, uh, of our own uh, library that initially was called the NHLib and then became the other library. So, and, and here in the rest of my presentation, I'm basically going to explain you um, what we have in the other library and, and what we and what we will put in the other library hopefully in the near future. The development of this component of the OpenQuick engine I think it can be separated into uh, three phases. The first one uh, between 2010 and 2014 which was the, the big uh, development phase. The one between 2015 and 2018 where during which there had been a lot of uh, uh, development uh, under the hood, uh, mostly in terms of efficiency, but without the introduction of many features and the phase uh, from 2019 on. So uh, the first phase, as I told you, was the one during which we did most of the, of the scientific implementation, where we added most of the scientific components, uh, which are the ones, by the way, that you already, uh, that you can still find now in the OpenQuick engine. So we have Three uh, calculation workflows, uh, a classical PSHA, the event based and, and the scenario based hazard assessment. Uh, we have uh, a consolidated set of uh, earthquake sources to, that are used uh, for uh, modeling uh, distributed seismicity, so point and area sources. Uh, we have three typologies of fault sources, uh, simple faults, uh, complex faults uh, and characteristic faults. Uh, and we also uh, have non-parametric uh, uh, sources, which is something that we introduced slightly later, but they are uh, quite useful and used a lot uh, uh, now because of their flexibility. For example, we use them for modeling in slab uh, ruptures uh, in, the, in the process that we follow for building uh, earthquake models at GEM. We also have a, a quite consolidated uh, library of ground motion models that grew throughout the years. And this is actually the component of the engine that received uh, the largest contribution for, from the community. I would say that is really a, a, a community effort in this case. Um, from 2015 until 2018, as I told you, uh, we didn't work very much at introducing new uh, scientific components to the engine because, as you can see in this, in this slide, we've been putting most of our efforts working in the, in, the, in the global hazard mosaic that was released in 2018. Uh, but, uh, but, and this is bringing us to, to basically where we stand now in terms of the other component of the OpenQuick engine with, with a set of, of features that uh, we believe are the, the, the ones uh, that are characterized in this part of the engine. So first of all, we think that uh, the Azad engine is, is versatile. So it's flexible and it's flexible in different ways. Uh, for example, it is flexible because it can be used as a library and, uh, and indeed there are components of the, of the other library used, for example, in the shake map system of the USGS, but you can use it also as a classical PSHA code from the common line. It's flexible because it can deal with a, a, a variety of other models. At the moment, uh, we, we support, uh, we are able to deal with almost all the, the public accessi publicly accessible other models available globally. 
And it's also flexible because it can work uh, seamlessly with the risk component of the engine. Other important features that we believe uh, you can find in the other component of the engine now are, are a, a large set of, of, of tests, unit tests as well as end-to-end -end, uh, tests. That doesn't mean that the engine is giving a perfect uh, results, but it means that with all these tests, we, we are checking that the engine is giving what we expect it should be giving. So if we understand something wrong, we, we give wrong results, but at least they are consistent. We have a large variety of ground motion models. So at the moment we have about 130 ground motion models. And if you include also the different, uh, let's say, subversions, uh, we reach uh, something like uh, 400 uh, models. We also have a, 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 a nice feature. We, I think it's, it's indeed something that I have promoted a lot, the user, a more extensive user of epistemic uncertainty in other calculation, which is the possibility of defining uh, for the user uh, the structure of the logic trees. So where the OpenCake engine was used, um, and I'm starting from regional projects because uh, regional projects were indeed the initial, uh, the initial target for the OpenQuake engine. So, and and the, the, the first target was indeed a calculation for Europe uh, within the SHARE project. Uh, um, and Laurencio, I think, uh, will mention that later on. Other projects at the regional level where the OpenQuake engine was used uh, is, the, is the MM model in the Middle East, uh, the MK project in, in Central Asia. Uh, uh, three projects led by, by GEM in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, one in South America and one in Central America and the Caribbean, and a community-driven model uh, in, South, uh, in Southeast Asia with participation from, from Thailand and from uh, Singapore in particular. Uh, the OpenQuake engine had been also used for performing national seismic hazard uh, mapping projects by a number of agencies. So starting from Canada in the, in the top uh, uh, left part of the slide, and they released actually uh, the latest version of, uh, of their national hazard model a few days ago. Going to the bottom right in New Zealand, where they started actually recently a new project for updating their national hazard maps, where the OpenQuick engine is also used in combination with, um, with OpenSH again in this case. And we also have a few, a few uh, cases in which uh, the OpenQuake engine was used uh, for site-specific studies. Uh, and here you can see countries where uh, the engine was used either, either as a primary code for calculations or a code for performing verifications. Uh, so from, from 2019, we started again to add some features. And now I'm giving you an idea of what, what's, uh, what's inside and maybe not very, very well explained at the moment in the documentation. For example, something that we added in 2019 is the possibility of computing hazard using clusters or ruptures. And uh, the implementation that we have uh, is, is following closely what is used by the USGS for modeling hazard in the New Madrid area. So uh, in, with this feature, uh, you can define uh, in your source model a source group, uh, as you can see here, you can uh, label this source group uh, as a cluster. And you can assign a, a temporal occurrence model, an occurrence rate in this case, uh, in order to define uh, the, the frequency of occurrence uh, of, of this, um, of this uh, uh, cluster of, of, of events. Uh, in 2020, we also started to uh, add uh, the possibility to uh, calculate uh, uh, hazard uh, taking into account amplification functions. Uh, and this is a project that we are uh, uh, doing in collaboration with the Colombian Geological Survey and with SURA. Uh, so the user is, is, uh, is now able to define uh, amplification functions uh, following a syntax, uh, following uh, basically using a, a CSV file. And uh, we have uh, at the moment three methodologies uh, uh, available for computing hazard at the ground surface. Uh, so we have the so-called convolution method. We have a more complex uh, uh, approach that is uh, implemented inside the, the other kernel. And we also offer the possibility of calculating ground motion fields uh, um, uh, for uh, using an event-based approach, uh, which is very important for the calculation of, of risk and losses. 
um, uh, for the future. So where we are going and which are the activities that we are starting now. So there's an increasing uh, number of, uh, of uh, models that uh, earthquake occurrence models that are based on full system solutions. And uh, these, uh, these models are, are quite challenging from a calculation standpoint because they include a, a, a very a huge amount of, of ruptures. In this, uh, in this plot, uh, you see uh, this stack uh, and every, every line, uh, every curve in this stack uh, is actually the trace of a rupture that is including this, this tiny segment uh, at, the, at the bottom. Uh, and this is a, this is a um, part of a, of a fault model that uh, we are currently developing, Thomas is developing for, uh, for China. Uh, so the challenge here is, is to make sure that the engine is, is efficient. And, and, uh, and also uh, there's a challenge of defining a sort of standardized ways to describe this complex uh, set of ruptures. And for this, uh, for this part, we are working in collaboration with the USGS and with, Gen with GNS Science in the framework of this project that is aiming to update their national hazard maps. We are also working at improving the, uh, the tra more traditional uh, fault, uh, fault uh, sources. And in particular, we are trying to take the best from, uh, from simple faults and complex faults and to avoid uh, problems uh, particularly related with the complex faults uh, 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 that are uh, connected with the floating of the ruptures. So we are developing a new fault typology that is uh, combining the two and it's called uh, uh, kite, uh, kite fault, uh, because it's made of, uh, of quadrilaterals. Uh, and uh, sorry, this, this is a feature that hopefully will, will come uh, in, in a few months. Uh, on the ground motion modeling side, uh, um, there is work, of course, uh, at trying to implement and make efficient the calculation of hazard when, uh, when we use uh, um, non-ergodic uh, ground motion models. Uh, so we, we implemented a, a, a few models that uh, appeared in the literature recently, and we are currently working with ADF and the Pacific Earthquake Engine Research Center at testing the implementation and, and the results obtained uh, using this type of, uh, of models. And work uh, on, along this uh, line was also done uh, within the, the SERA project in Europe recently. The last, uh, last feature that uh, is, uh, is, um, is in the pipeline for the uh, relatively near future is the incorporation of aftershocks and foreshocks into PSHA calculation. That's, that's actually very important. And you can see, for example, in this, uh, in this plot uh, where, I'm where we are comparing the hazard curves uh, for the long-term hazard with the hazard curves that you calculate, uh, uh, that we calculated in this case, Robin calculated in this case, uh, during the uh, recent uh, uh, sequence in central Italy. So the difference uh, is, is uh, stunning. And so having the possibility of taking into account and calculating the hazard during aftershock sequences is important. Uh, so for this, uh, we, what we plan to do is to, is to um, start from the Boyd uh, 2012 uh, um, methodology and perhaps uh, if with, with time available uh, to extend it uh, in, in the future. This is work that we plan to do inside a, a project called METIS, uh, which is a European funded project uh, that we are starting now, led by EDF. And uh, this is actually a project where the, the other team of GEM is heavily involved uh, and will give us the possibility of uh, in adding a number of uh, new features inside the OpenQuake engine. That's all from my side. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a work cloud with the name of all the uh, persons that contributed to the OpenQuake engine, they, they are more than 50. So uh, we, we are uh, very, very grateful to all of them for their contribution. And of course, we are very grateful to all the organizations uh, that throughout the years uh, had been supporting GEM and helped us uh, in, in, in giving resources for, for maintaining this tool that is uh, freely and openly accessible to all the community. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you for racing through your slides. All of you for, for having a proper introduction. Um, we're going to move on to the, to the next speaker. Uh, I would like to, to remind everyone, though, if you'd like to use the, um, like to, to uh, submit a question, please use the Q&A button. 
and then we will we will uh, log those questions and, and we'll come back at the end, uh, time permitting, to allow you to ask some questions, or we'll, we'll we'll refer back to those questions. So please write them in, and then we can uh, we can identify key ones to uh, present. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Lorenzo Dantu. He's a senior researcher and earthquake engineer at the Swiss Seismological Service in Zurich, where he specializes in earthquake hazard research uh, for hazard mapping, structural response, vulnerability, and, and seismic risk and loss evaluation. He's worked closely with GEM since the very beginning uh, on the seismic hazard assessments for Europe, on op open quake training, on software development, and many other applications. So. Um, uh, Lorenzo, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Um, can we check? Can you see this my 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 slides? Marco, can we see my slides? Yeah, perfectly. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So I share the joy to contribute to this webinar. I, I share the joy to celebrate 10 years for, for OpenQuake. Uh, it has been, it has, it, it's a great news to see OpenQuake uh, standing after, after the GEM1 pilot uh, project that uh, we began in, in 2009, 2010, the journey of, of GEM Global Mosaic at, uh, at ETH, the Swiss Seismological Service. Uh, Marco mentioned before, we are the first two members, followed by, by Damiano of this first uh, hazard team at, at GEM1. And in GEM1, was, the pilot project was quite important because it, it established the, the foundation for OpenQuake, but also the, 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 the way, the pathway to, to complete the global mosaic on the G-SHAP uh, legacy. And that that was was quite relevant for the for the next ten years for for myself, but also I guess for for Gem and and all the in-house uh, expertise that we have acquired in at at ETH. So we have contributed to to to, to the first two regional projects, with the, which was the European and the, the Middle East project. We were probably the first national model releasing an official. Uh, seismic hazard model with built and and run and uh, with with OpenQuake, and we also in Switzerland. Perhaps you you may know we have one of the most uh, complex uh, uh, seismic hazard model ever uh, developed for a nuclear facility, and we have used also OpenQuake for for checking some components of that that calculation. So, what I want to 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 point out today is I, I want to, to not to describe the models, not to, not to go through, through greater detail, but I would like to, to, to mention a few aspects of, of, the, of the model integration and the way the engine has been developed through the three years. So for e, the, the European hazard model was the first hazard, uh, regional hazard model to be built, to be, to be computed with OpenQuake and uh, you, you heard before that there were two, two ways of, of computing or of developing, uh, underlying the development of an open quake, and that was a Java and a Python component. And those two, they will have a big impact because the, the calculation time of such a large models, complex models, it, it proven to be a key aspect in the development of such models. So, we, what you see here, you see a, a synopsis of the of the two European models, one in 1999 and the, the 2013. You see that you you move for a, what I called unified and unity model from one model, one source model to multiple choices, multiple uh, complex models. So mentioning before the the. Um, computational time, I would like to, to point to the, to the chart on the right hand side where the Java version, which, we, which OpenQuake was built, which was the OpenSHA, with our current back then hardware uh, uh, limitations, let's say hardware uh, setup, we were, a, we were uh, forecasting a, a run of about 180 days. Of course, the development, uh, the, the progress with, with such models would be impossible. And then there is a transition, a parallel transition on the Python version 
and that significantly reduced uh, the computational time. And this is something that today is taken as granted, but this is an, a continuous effort for the uh, GEM team on the development part, both hazard and, and IT team to optimize such large calculations. And for, for years, the share or the ESHM 13 model was the stress test for the engine. I think we lost that, that, that title with, with the California with USERF, but we come back with, uh, with the 2020 European hazard model. So I think we are, we're still having challenges to, 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 to compute that. Back then, we do had a lot of fun to, with the agile development. And I shared the, the, the office with, with Damiano Monelli, who was uh, the, one of the lead architects and, and he was prioritizing the, the features of OpenQuake based on the requirements of the ESHM 13, 13 model. Uh, I would say we had good fun to, to prioritize on the whiteboards those, those features of the engine. An important, an important feature of the engine, Marco mentioned it, is the, the, the opportunity and the possibility to apply or to, to build and develop new ground motion models. This, uh, this component is a key for any hazard assessment. And back then in about 2012, we established based on what we're building in, in the ESHM 13, um, the procedure to test and to visualize later on become the, the tools, the toolkit of uh, Graham Weatherill to, to visualize such, such, uh, such uh, models. Marco mentioned there are about 130, we began with 24, and we also evolve in this type of models. And this type of models, the way the epistemic uh, uncertainty has, is handled, you see it over, over time, it moves from multiple GMPs back then in 2013 to something rather different and complex and uh, is what we call today a regional backbone model to be used in the 2020 European hazard model. And again, the back, back compatibility of such tools enable you to see what you get, to see what you are actually using for, for hazard calculation in these such tra trellis plots between the two models. Uh, in the 2015, we have been using for a first time uh, extended ground motion models. These extended ground motion models, they will account for various adjustments of the VS30 kappa, of the magnitude, small magnitudes, or even for, for different components of the aleatory uncertainty. So in, for us, the, 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 open, the open source, the, the, the capabilities of OpenQuake to, to contribute and to implement such model was a key, was a key, was a key feature. And again, the, you, you notice here a logic tree in, for, the, for the Swiss hazard, we had a very complex logic tree and bring us to another future important for any hazard calculation, the way we handle the model uncertainties. And in, in, in the 2015, our, our model was using five different seismogenic source representations with different uh, uh, temporal uh, variability uncertainty and the relevant ground motion component. And with that, we, we were sampling about a million and branches in a hundred thousand, and we were able to run these this calculations and get the right amount of spread uh, around the, the results, which is currently our, our uh, reference and national hazard model for Switzerland. And with, with, uh, with some extent, the, the way the, the uncertainty are modeled in, in, in OpenQuake, it allows us to implement complex, very, very complex model. I mentioned before the, the site-specific uh, assessment where in general you have two, you have, you have pre-processing and you have post-processing components to establish the range of uncertainty or to be able to run calculations. Such, such calculations are, are such flowchart it's not relevant today because OpenQuake enables you to, to do an end-to-end -end calculation or a sampling of the, of the logic trees. And this is extremely important for, the, for, for any complex hazard model. Um, it was a long and, and difficult learning curve because we have begun, we, the, the, we introduced concept of, of Git, we have introduced concepts of, of pull and merge requests. These this were non, non-existent to, to the community. 
And we had multiple seminars, multiple training and uh, workshops to explain how one or how, what is the, the, the benefit of contributing and how one could, could uh, tailor to fit their models into the uh, overall OpenQuake uh, framework, source models, logic trees, and ground motion models. And one, one resource that is often neglected, in my opinion, neglected, neglected, sorry, in my opinion, is the blog or, or the advanced user documentation of Michele Simonato, which is the, he is the lead architect of all this complex uh, architecture of behind OpenQuake. And I will highly recommend for those that are jumping into complex calculation to, to go and visit this, this site because this is where everything begins for, for complex model. Um, Thank you. Thank yes, you. I please, am. Please wrap up. Thanks. Yeah, I'm about to finish. So I my takeaway message, yes, OpenQuake is a game changer. Uh, it, it allows the models to grow at the same time with the features and the capabilities of this, of this, uh, of, of the, of the uh, platform overall. It has an outstanding support for developing and implementing models and tools. Uh, it's an excellent community with an engagement and support. And I would like to also to, to thanks to the many, many researchers that they have contributed to these uh, regional models and the, with some extent to the GEM uh, Global Mosaic. And very quickly, I would like to congratulate, first of all, the, the teams behind the OpenQuake. And I would like to thank everyone at GEM that has been working and I really wish that we would have been today in Pavia and cheer a glass of, 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 of something for, for, for OpenQuake. Thank you very much. Okay, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, thanks very much. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions for you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Yu Fang Rong. Uh, she's a scientist and seismologist at FM Global in Boston. Uh, FM Global has been a, a sponsor of GEM, I think also from the beginning. Uh, and they are uh, focused on insurance for industrial risks. Uh, Yu Fong has worked uh, with GEM very, very closely as well for, for many years, leveraging GEM models and data to develop earthquake hazard and risk models for FM Global applications. Uh, Yu Fong, um, please, uh, please show your presentation and uh, we, we, uh, we welcome you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, John, for the nice introduction. Can you see my screen now? Yes, right. Um, so hello, everyone. My topic is, oh, so, sorry, let me uh, use presentation mode. Um, my topic is seismic hazard analysis for engineering-based insurance applications. So again, my name is Yu Fang Rong. I'm from FM Global. Um, FM Global is an insurance company. It's a mutual insurance company headquartered in Rhode Island, United States. Our company employs a non-traditional business model in which risk and the premiums are determined by engineering analysis as opposed to actuary calculations. That's why in, in my topic, I say it's for engineering-based insurance applications. So today we are here to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of OpenQuick Engine. So I would like to use this opportunity to show how OpenQuick Engine has helped us develop our uh, products, the products for our company and then for our clients. So I'm going to talk about three applications here. Um, prob probabilistic seismic hazard analysis for mainland China, global risk targeted ground motions, and global earthquake risk map. So in the past several years, we developed a probabilistic seismic hazard model for mainland China as many other models. We use the historical earthquake catalog and active faults data. But in addition to that, we also explicitly used the, the screen rate data, which is shown on the right of the three plots. Um, to integrate the data together, we work together with Jem, uh, with Marco um, and others to 
to create it, uh, to create a um, tool which we call Earthquake Model Building Toolkit. So using the toolkit, we are able to produce earthquake source models, which can be directly sent to OpenQuick Engine for a calc hazard calculation. So here I'm showing you um, two seismic hazard maps. On the left, it is 500 years better acceleration at one second on rock set condition. And on the right one is the same hazard, but with set amplification considered. So it's worth to mention that um, it would not be possible to develop this model without the collaboration with JAM to develop the toolkit without the availability of OpenQuick Engine and uh, without the collaboration with our colleagues in China Earthquake Administration. I'm showing their names here. So they have done tremendous, uh, tremendous work to collect data and process data for us. Um, so our next two applications are all at global scale. So GEM, as you have seen from Art Marco's presentation, GEM has uh, collated and developed hazard models to cover almost the whole world. I use the word almost because GEM did not release a model for China. Here, fortunately, we have an in-house model for China. And GEM didn't release model for uh, Greenland. We built a model for Greenland. And um, to, so, so our mosaic model uses GEM's mosaic for almost all the countries, plus um, China model from our um, development and the Greenland model. And then for US, we use 2018 national model um, because GEM hasn't incorporated into OpenQuick. So, um, so with OpenQuick, uh, we are able to calculate hazard for all the models because OpenQuick is transparent and easy to use. So we are able to do a lot of sensitivity tests. We are able to examine model uncertainties and we are even able to adjust some model components based on our own analysis. So by the end, we calculated hazard for uh, the whole world. And our first application of the global um, uh, hazard is to create global risk targeted ground motions. So we, uh, by the way, uh, risk, risk targeted ground motion um, what well, the difference between um, fixed year ground motion. So this one considers the uh, targeted risk instead of a uniform hazard. So, so we are able to produce global risk targeted ground motions following the same procedure as ESC E7 and USPS which can have a lot of um, application in our business. And in addition, our team um, developed a global site condition map because we know everyone knows that site conditions are critical for seismic hazard analysis. So we constructed this global soil map mainly using geology as proxy and the color shows the Nihorp site cat categories. The red, orange are soft uh, side soil, so which will amplify ground motion greatly. So by using the hazard and then the soil maps, we are able to produce so-called surface ground motions. So those are ground motions after we consider site amplification. This example shows surface PGA at 200 uh, 2,500 year return period. And uh, of course, we are also able to produce surface global risk target ground motions. So uh, the left one is sh short period um, target ground motion. The right one is long period one. And our third application application is to produce a global 
earthquake risk map with hazard and vulnerability as input. So again, the hazard was the same as what I just talked about. Vulnerab for vulnerability part, we used a, a gem vulnerability functions. And then our risk map, which is shown on the right, shows the return periods of slight damage to weak buildings. So I'm going to show you a larger version of the map. So we produced earthquake risk zones from 50 years all the way to greater than 5,000 years. Of course, the dark purple, red, orange, which are high risk area. Um, so here, which are uh, shorter return periods of slight damage. Um, so and our engineering division uses such maps to provide recommendations such as seismic breathing for our clients and our underwriting division can use it for pricing and setting up terms and conditions. So to summarize, we have been using OpenQuick Engine and other GEM products in our engineering based insurance applications. So. Um, I would like to thank many people for this these three applications. First, from within FM Global, because um, um, I would not read all the names, but within FM Global, our those people all contribute to the global risk map, China project, risk target, ground motion, equate uh, ground motions, and then we got a lot of help from Jam from Robin and Marco helped us with Global Hazard Model and um, Anirudh Rao and Vitor helped us with, um, with risk apart and Michaela and Daniela and the others IT team helped us with OpenQuick Engine. And of course, we thank our channel or speak administration friends and then we thank a lot of people from other organizations uh, who helped us with either the models or a very useful discussion. So that's all I have. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Yufang, uh, for a very, very nice presentation. Um, uh, global impact uh, of your work is, uh, is, is very um, nice to see. Uh, Vitor? Silva is next up. We're going to shift to, to risk here. Vitor is uh, an earthquake engineer and the risk team leader at JAM. Uh, he's been in that role, I think, uh, for about six years now. Uh, he's uh, responsible for the development of the risk component of the OpenQuake engine, the development of the global risk model, and is coordinating uh, many activities uh, across many projects uh, for JAM worldwide. Uh, the title of Vitor's presentation uh, is uh, Quake Engine Risk, Past, Present, and Future. Vitor, take it away. Thanks. Thank you, John. I think it's, it's more than six years, or at least it feels more than six years. Um, yes, yeah, so I would like to give a, a presentation about the risk component of the OpenQuake Engine on behalf of, of, of many, many people. Um, but I would like to particularly recognize the contribution of our Chief um, OpenQuake developer, uh, Michele Simeonato, and also from uh, Anirudh Rao, uh, who leads most of the OpenQuake development on the, um, on the risk team side. So um, everything started, as, as Marco mentioned in his presentation, uh, on the 21st of July, 2010. Uh, certainly not uh, necessarily some of the um, risk components that we have already there, but the very beginning. And um, we can say that we started in 2010, uh, but not really, because in fairness, before we even started coding anything in OpenQuake on the risk side, several other software packages were tested, like, for example, ASU, ZQRIM, Selena. And uh, the revision of these um, package tools allow us to define the uh, requirements, the needs, both from a technical, scientific, from an IT perspective, and also to define the um, main pillars, basically the main uh, calculators that we should have. Uh, on OpenQuake Engine on the risk side. And I would like to mention a little bit of each one of these calculators for some of you that are not um, uh, so familiar with OpenQuake. So um, one of the simplest calculators in the OpenQuake Engine is the scenario loss calculator. 
in this workflow, um, a seismic rupture is defined in order to generate many realizations of the ground shaking um, in the affected area. And one or multiple ground motion prediction equations can be used. It is also necessary to have an exposure model defining the location, the value, occupants, number of buildings, and finally also vulnerability modeling, establishing the probability of loss ratio conditional on um, ground shaking intensity. And with this calculator that considers just a single rupture, it is possible to generate, for example, loss maps and loss statistics. The loss maps contain the mean losses uh, in the affected region and loss statistics, like for example, the mean and the standard deviation um, of the uh, total losses or for subsets of the exposure model. We then expanded this a little bit more. So not just take into account losses, but also take into account damage. Once again, it is necessary to have a seismic rupture. It is necessary to have an exposure model, but now we use what we call fragility functions, which established a relation between a probability of exceeding a set of damage states, conditional once again on ground shaking. The outputs from this calculator are also similar to the ones that were presented before. Now we have damage maps, which have, for example, the number of buildings in slight damage or, um, or that collapse uh, throughout our region, or damage statistics, which, for example, can have as the number of, of buildings in each damage state across the different building classes. Some of the initial applications of these two calculators that consider just a single rupture um, were, for example, in the school infrastructure in Basel, or, for example, um, doing several earthquake scenarios in Nepal uh, uh, and focusing particularly in, in Kathmandu. Again, very early stages of op open quake and testing already some of these features. Although the impact from single event is important, uh, we obviously understood that for certain purposes, it is necessary to consider all of the possible events that might occur within a given region. So um, in this context, also a classical PSHA risk calculator was implemented. In this workflow, it is necessary to provide a probabilistic seismic hazard model, uh, such as the ones that were presented by Marco and, and by Lorenzo uh, previously. Um, but then we also take a, a step forward and we bring once again the exposure model and vulnerability model. We can take into account several sources of epistemic uncertainty, both on the seismic uh, source model and also in the selection of the GMPs. And the type of results that now we have are what we call um, risk maps that have, for example, the average general losses throughout our region, also um, loss exceedance curves, which have the losses for specific assets. Finally, um, uh, uh, we understood that it was also necessary to have this event-based risk calculator because if you want to aggregate the losses for specific types of uh, risk outputs, uh, it is necessary to follow this event-based approach. The ingredients, the input files are the same for this calculator. The outputs are also quite similar. We still can, we still can produce risk maps and loss exceedance curves for different um, assets, but now it is possible also to have problem maximum losses, loss exceedance curves, event loss tables, which can be aggregated for the entire portfolio or can also be produced for specific subsets of the building portfolio. For example, buildings with a specific insurance policy or buildings that belong to a specific building class. This basically ends this initial uh, development of OpenQuake on the risk component. This first four years uh, of, of, the, of, of development uh, what usually we call the dark ages of open quake because it was very early stages, uh, but still a lot of the applications of, of open quake, the testing uh, was made by uh, some of our PhD students. And then obviously also by some of our uh, GEM partners uh, doing event-based calculations in some countries in Europe and Southeast Asia and also in South America. After this initial development of OpenQuake, we had a period of dissemination with plenty of requests from users, which shaped the enhancement and the extension of the functionalities of OpenQuake. Uh, for example, a user interface to support users preparing input files and the classical PSHA risk calculator was extended to also um, use uh, fragility functions. So this way we can also calculate, for example, average annual probability of having different damage states. And this was, for example, recently used on the national risk model for Italy. And 2016 was marked by an urgent need to improve the computational performance of the OpenQuake engine, uh, partially motivated by the requirements of some projects and also recently released uh, models, like for example, the USERF-3 uh, as a model for California. Um, these improvements allow to um, handle models with thousands of logic trees 
uh, which is extremely necessary nowadays um, without the need for supercomputers. In 2017, uh, some of the, the, the requests from the user shifted a little bit, it was much more about verification, validation, and, and, and calibration. So we needed to improve the features that we had in OpenQuick uh, to facilitate this process of testing. So um, basically, uh, we, we, we did an implementation uh, of this module that uh, links OpenQuake with USGS shape maps in order to test risk models with data from recent events, as well as a better way to disaggregate losses according to specific features of the exposure model in order to understand what is driving the risk in particular regions. And this is something that even today we keep using to try to calibrate to continuously improve our models. In 2008, um, it was a year to try to push OpenQuake to its limits and try to also get out of the, of the single building risk assessment. So um, uh, this event-based uh, feature was implemented that basically allows exporting a lot of information um, from OpenQuake, like for example, for each realization, where are the pieces of our system which have specific damage states, which allow applying uh, OpenQuake, for example, to transportation uh, uh, networks to do risk in infrastructure. Also an extension of the logic trees to, uh, uh, to the vulnerability component. And obviously we had to improve a lot the computational performance of OpenQuake because this was the year where we were testing continental scale uh, calculations in order to release the global risk model, which was released in December of this year. So last year, we saw some new applications of OpenQuake, again, at continental risk calculations, for example, for Europe within the SETA project, which uh, are obviously continuing this year. Uh, the extension of some of the functionalities, for example, to volcanic risk assessment, and even some applications by the industry. For example, we saw OpenQuake being explored by induced seismicity, both in the United States and in the Netherlands. So it, it is quite interesting to see OpenQuake being applied in different purposes for what it was developed initially, and obviously being seen as a trust um, uh, tool in the industry and engineering sector. This basically takes us to today. So what are we, what are we doing, where are we going? Um, so something that was quite unique at the beginning of this year was obviously the, the, the pandemic and uh, uh, the GEM team received a request from a few partners about how can OpenQuake be used to estimate potential impact that earthquakes might have in the current uh, pandemic. So we did a lot of tests so basically using both the scenario um, uh, and event risk calculators to demonstrate how OpenQuake can be used to predict possible outcomes, as well as to highlight the regions in a world of particular concern. And uh, I hope that OpenQuake can continue being seen and expanded in this direction. So basically not just doing the single building risk assessment and only for the purposes of uh, earthquake loss assessment, but also seeing how it can be useful um, uh, to, other, to other challenges. Also, um, we've been trying to uh, tap in, in groundbreaking data sets, models, and technologies to ensure that um, OpenQuake is not only um, reacting to current challenges, but also ahead of emerging needs. And this includes improvement of the manner that OpenQuake handles multiple calculations in order to forecast risk into the future. So basically not just estimating the risk today, but also trying to understand how the risk is expected to change in the future. And um, we're also exploring the benefits of using uh, technology that is already being used in uh, other fronts, but not so much in earthquake risk assessment, or at least not in um, operational basis, uh, related with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, artificial neural networks. And this is something that so far has been showing uh, very promising results. Finally, I wanted to mention just that we're also taking the first steps in the risk assessment due to secondary perils. So basically local function and landslides, uh, um, and partially due to this project supported by USAID uh, called TREC, and also uh, continue uh, improving the performance of OpenQuake and the amount of results that we can export to OpenQuake. So it can also be applied once again, not just on buildings, but also infrastructure and networks. I would like to finish with this slide. Uh, this basically shows all the places where OpenQuake has been used, either for hazard or, or, or risk assessment. So I think we can say now that OpenQuake is, is a mature tool that is used globally. Um, it is used by the industry. It is used by the public sector. Um, it is used in the, uh, uh, by the academia and teaching some of the courses at universities. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, I recommend you to check uh, the YouTube channel 
uh, that has already some training videos. Uh, this is something we've been using, we've been exploring quite, quite recently. And I hope that once we have new webinars and other presentations, that we can see this map uh, with more and more dots in the future. Once again, I just wanted to thank you, um, all of you, for taking the time to attend this uh, this webinar. But obviously, all of the partners, all of the sponsors, all of the collaborators of GEM that made the development of OpenQuick uh, possible. Thank you very much. Vitor, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, very excellent presentation. Uh, also for showing one of my slides that I failed to show during the, <laughs> the introduction, the one, the summary with all the uh, the applications which really shows uh, very clearly uh, where, where uh, OpenQuake is being used uh, globally. Um, time to shift to uh, Murray Journay. Mur Murray um, is a research scientist at the Geological Survey of Canada, based in Vancouver. His expertise ranges from field-based investigations of regional tectonic processes through to computer-based modeling of earthquake risk and risk reduction strategies. So Murray um, really connects all the dots from uh, one to the other. Uh, he's worked with GEM very, very closely for many years, uh, implementing tools and models and uh, developing risk assessment uh, capability for, uh, for Canada. Murray, take it away, thanks. Great, thanks John for this opportunity to help celebrate the 10th anniversary of OpenQuake and to share our story of uh, working with GEM over the years to build a national seismic uh, risk model for Canada. Uh, from the outset, this has been a, an extremely rich and rewarding collaboration between Natural Resources Canada and uh, members of the GEM Hazard Risk and IT teams. And I wanted to take this opportunity to both acknowledge and thank their many contributions over the last five years. The story for us began um, at a GEM risk modeling workshop in Pavia at the end of uh, 2014, where I was introduced to the OpenQuake platform and to an amazing group of dedicated researchers and, and developers. I came to Pavia to learn how to run OpenQuake and I left with an opportunity to build uh, a, a national seismic uh, risk model for Canada as part of GEM's broader mission to develop an integrated global fabric of, of earthquake models. National seismic hazard models have been developed by researchers at Natural Resources Canada since the early uh, 1970s. Under the leadership of John Adams, uh, these models are updated every five years to reflect an evolving understanding of earthquake hazards in Canada. The outputs of these models are incorporated into each new iteration of the National Building Code. And um, to ensure that seismic safety guidelines are appropriately implemented and equitably distributed across Canada. In 2014, Trevor Allen and John Adams worked with colleagues at GEM to adapt the 2015 PSHA model for use in OpenQuake. The results were validated against reference values that are used uh, as part of our national building code, and established for the first time the necessary foundation to build a fully integrated set of hazard and risk models for Canada. When I joined Trevor for the risk modeling workshop in Pavia, we had also just received uh, initial outputs of our 2015 national census, which provides detailed population and demographic statistics at a neighborhood level uh, across Canada. Uh, it includes building counts for about 9.7 structure, uh, 7 million structures uh, at 2.2 million unique asset locations and a wide range of demographic variables for more than 35 million people concentrated in urban centers and in rural uh, settlements scattered across an extremely vast Canadian landscape that ranks number two in the world in terms of uh, total land area. By combining these two data sets, we were able to document two really important trends. First, dense urban settlements are concentrated in areas exposed to seismic hazard. Nearly uh, one third of Canadians are exposed to levels of uh, very strong and severe ground shaking with a potential for uh, significant damage in, in many areas of concern. Second, like many other countries, the profile of disaster risk is escalating at an alarming rate here in Canada, with the number of people exposed to significant earthquake hazards almost doubling over a 40-year period. Two months after that 2014 uh, risk modeling workshop, uh, UNSISDR launched the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, which laid out a set of uh, global targets uh, for, the, uh, for a 15-year period. 
Uh, this was an important uh, landmark for us in that it uh, developed not only a set of policies, but also a framework of indicators to both monitor uh, disaster risk trends uh, over that 15 year period, but also to harmonize uh, the outputs of risk models that are used to anticipate the impacts of future disasters. Uh, this was also a, a period of time when uh, there was convergence between work across many different fields. And so Sendai also opened the door for integrating disaster risk reduction into the broader uh, fields of emergency management, community planning, and, and financial risk uh, planning. So uh, Canada signed on to the Sendai framework and very quickly uh, emergency managers, community planners, and financial analysts began knocking at the door. Uh, we rolled up our sleeves called our friends at GEM and began uh, a, a five-year sprint to build a national uh, seismic hazard and risk model that would be fully integrated from end to end, and that would provide the necessary base of evidence to inform, and we hoped empower disaster resilience planning initiatives at local and regional scales across Canada. We started with a pilot in British Columbia with uh, Emergency Management BC, um, developing uh, regional earthquake hazard and risk models to inform the development of their emergency management plans uh, at a regional scale. And uh, we then very quickly uh, started to scale those models up to a national level uh, using the, the 2015 PSHA model as our base and bringing in our national uh, physical exposure and social vulnerability models. As Vitor mentioned, we, we uh, looked at both uh, the probabilistic and deterministic components of, of seismic hazard and risk as we were developing these models and, and testing them. At about uh, the same time in 2018, 2019, uh, researchers at Natural Resources Canada were busy uh, developing early stages of uh, our, uh, uh, the sixth generation uh, Canadian seismic hazard model. And we realized that uh, with the impending release of the model, uh, there was an opportunity for us to uh, both refine the risk component, but also to get ready for uh, full integration between the hazard and risk, which occurred uh, this year. Uh, and we're uh, in the final stages of uh, generating uh, what we're calling our second generation national uh, seismic risk model. Uh, the outputs of the model will be released next year, um, and they're meant to be shared through an open data platform uh, to municipal, regional, and national partners, but also uh, to feed up into the global fabric. So our, our view of integrated risk assessment is, uh, is a very much an iterative process of analysis and evaluation and involves three stages. First, uh, the first stage is using uh, the uh, quantitative risk uh, models that Vitor outlined to uh, develop baseline risk scenarios that make evident the expected impacts and consequences of future disaster events. The outputs are used primarily in the field of emergency management to help identify uh, immediate impacts and consequences and to uh, refine those, those plans. The second stage for us is using the same open quake uh, uh, models to develop what we call what if planning scenarios. These are models that help identify actions or policies that uh, have potential to minimize the negative impacts of future disasters and uh, to enhance functional recovery. Um, so this is very much an iterative process of modeling to uh, identify alternatives that are then uh, considered in the context of planning and policy development, uh, largely within the context of, of community planning. To support uh, these planning initiatives, it was really important for us to develop a framework of indicators that met the needs and operational requirements of our end users. So we use OpenQuake to measure impacts to the built environment um, and of, of course, building damage, but also looking at recovery time, disaster debris, um, the implications of building damage for uh, public safety, uh, economic losses, and uh, social disruption. Uh, but like Jen, we also uh, viewed integrated risk assessment as a blending of uh, understanding not only the physical impacts, but uh, the consequences of those impacts on, on people. And so we developed uh, a, a parallel social vulnerability model to look at the strain on, on social fabric. And this was really to help us get to the point where we could start uh, thinking about and modeling functional recovery. So we use the outputs of the model to help us uh, get a sense of what the degradation of, 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 of functional capabilities are immediately after the earthquake and how long it might take to restore those, those functions. We also use the models to help identify what would be a, a, a more desirable 
uh, outcome or, uh, through the lens of functional recovery. Uh, so the question of how do we get from uh, the, the, the current uh, outcome to a, a better outcome involves looking at a range of strategies, including um, how to increase the physical resistance of the built environment through investments in seismic retrofit, how to accelerate response and recovery functions to, um, to result in a, in a quicker recovery, and how to minimize the burden of risk on, on vulnerable populations. Uh, so the, for the last few slides, I just wanted to show um, the, some of the outputs of our model at a national scale. Uh, here looking at average annual losses across the country and how they're distributed at a provincial uh, and territorial scale with the bulk uh, of these losses uh, in uh, Western Canada and British Columbia and along the St. Lawrence Seaway in Quebec and Ontario. Uh, we also look at those losses through the lens of, uh, of probable maximum loss over different return periods. And in Canada, we have a risk tolerance threshold uh, defined by our financial regulators uh, at, uh, as a 500-year loss. So one of the outputs is looking at uh, that 500-year loss at different places across Canada. Um, this provides the context then to look at more specific uh, uh, risk reduction strategies. Uh, which we often do through the lens of uh, scenario models. And so my colleague Tegan Hobbs is leading an effort to build a scenario catalog uh, for Canada that looks at representative uh, events from that, uh, from that uh, stochastic set uh, and to help make evident the implications of those events on, on settled areas in Canada. Uh, so here we're in Western Canada focusing in on Vancouver and just to give a sense of how we use these scenario models uh, to support emergency management and community planning um, down at the neighborhood level. Uh, and I wanted to demonstrate with the last few slides how we, we blend the physical risk uh, with the social vulnerability to really get at, uh, at, at the, uh, how the burden of risk is, is, uh, is impacting different vulnerable populations. Our social vulnerability and uh, community archetype work is led by uh, my colleague Jackie Yip, um, who has been uh, exploring the use of uh, machine learning to develop uh, a, a, a different way of looking at social vulnerability uh, through neighborhood archetypes. And we use uh, a blend of the physical impacts, so the, the outputs of our uh, risk models with these neighborhood archetypes uh, to uh, generate what, uh, what we're calling these integrated risk profiles, which look at how the burden of risk is shared across these different uh, neighborhoods, both for baseline conditions, and also if we were to invest in seismic retrofit policies. Um, right. the, last, the last slide, and I'll finish here, is, uh, is our plans to, to share this uh, information out. Uh, so uh, my colleague, Jos Van Olden, is leading an effort to build an open, uh, open data platform uh, where this information will be shared uh, with, with our partners. And with that, I'll pass it back to John, and, and thank you again very much for uh, the opportunity. Uh, thanks very much, Murray. Uh, I, as as usual, so fascinated by your slides that um, I, I couldn't bear to um, speed you up. But that was a great presentation. Thanks very much. Um, our last presentation is by Ana Beatriz uh, Acevedo. She's a professor of civil engineering um, at at Ayafit University in Medellin, Colombia. Her current research interests include seismic risk assessment, seismic structural performance, and disaster mitigation. Uh, she's worked very closely with JEM on projects in South America, uh, is using OpenQuake extensively in her classes, and has several graduate student projects leveraging JEM tools for risk assessment studies. So Anna, we uh, look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> so, um... Thank you so much for the invitation. For me, it is really a pleasure to be here in this celebration. So I'm here to talk to you about the urban risk assessment in Colombia. Uh, we recently developed an assessment of the three major cities of Colombia, which is Bogota that has more than uh, 8, 8 million inhabitants and Medellin and Cali, which each one has 2.5 million inhabitants. And you can see here in the bottom, this is the city of Medellin where I live. And you can imagine that to develop a seismic risk assessment of such a big city, it has many challenges. And I guess it will be of your interest to find out how we overcome those challenges and how we were able to provide risk metrics 
But I decided that I better not talk about that. I think it would be more interesting for you to find out how I move from being a person that seven years ago, I only had um, a very barely knowledge about seismic rigs and how now I can say I am a risk modeler. So it all started in 2013. Uh, I was invited to be part of the South America Risk Assessment Project, the SARA project. This project had a duration of two years. And I call this my period in which I knew GEM and I began to use OpenQuake. In this project, uh, my task was to, to help with the development of exposure and vulnerability models for Colombia. But we also received training on risk assessment and we also had two trainings that included the use of OpenQuake. So when the SARA project finished, uh, my relationship with them did not. Uh, by working on the SARA project, I realized that I needed to keep learning more about seismic risks, especially for the country where I'm coming from. So I decided that I needed to have more training. And this is a second period that I called OpenQuake training. In 2015, I went to Pavia. Uh, for a workshop on OpenQuake. And after doing that workshop, I was able to perform my analysis by myself. Of course, uh, I never let uh, Jen uh, on the side and all this work has been done with close collaboration, especially of Catalina and Vitor from Jen. So on 2016, we performed a seismic risk assessment of one of the building typology that is most common in my region. But then we realized that a training, we need more training, and we decided to do a seminar and a workshop, but this time we decided to bring the seminar to Colombia. And for me, this was one of the key issues on my relationship with GEM and also with the seismic risk. So I'm going to spend one slide on that seminar. We had a, this a event that we have an attendance of more than 100 people from public institutions, private institutions, colleagues from other universities. We even have people from other countries. Uh, this event was possible because of the collaboration of EAFIT University, GEM, uh, Vitor and Catalina came here to Colombia and they gave us the training. But we also have a very interesting collaboration, of course, with Jane, but also with the Canadian Geological Survey. As you can see in the picture, Maury came here to Colombia. But we also began a collaboration that was much needed in my country and several national institutions that are related to disaster risk management. We got together into this uh, event. And for me, that was really the most important uh, issue of this event. And for me, as I told you before, it was a, a turning point. So now I start a new, new period that I'm calling networking. And I can tell you that from that time, 2017 up to now, I, I have been in very close collaboration with many of these institutions. Like for example, in this picture uh, in 2017, um, John, Catalina, people from GEM is here, but also people from other institutions. And for that first time, for me at least, we all talk together and begin to think about what can we do to improve our city in terms of seismic risk. So this is a collaboration that is still going on. But 2017 was uh, a very important year for me for many reasons. And then uh, after the training and all the things that I had done before, I realized that I, I had the knowledge and that I should transfer the, this knowledge. So from 2017 to now, uh, OpenQuake and seismic risk assessment is being used in the classroom. So uh, the students, graduate and undergraduate students at EAFIT University uh, use OpenQuake to perform risk analysis. And many graduate students have been using OpenQuake to do their master or doctoral thesis, uh, many of them on the seismic risk assessment of buildings, but some of them have used OpenQuake to do assessment in other type of infrastructure, like for example, electric substations, water supply system, and we even use it for the assessment of earthquake induced landslides in Quito, Ecuador. So this will bring me to now, the year 2020. I know this is a very important year for many of us in so many reasons. 
But in terms of my relationship with Jem, uh, I would call this the application year because thanks to all this networking and to all the knowledge that I have acquired working closely with Jem, uh, I feel that now the work that I'm doing it's useful, and I think that um, decision makers can use these results to actually improve our resilience. So for example, now I can talk about the urban risk assessment in Colombia. This is a, a work that I did with the collaboration of other institutions. And because of this collaboration, we could use the more recent seismic hazard model that, that has been developed for Colombia, which was developed at the Colombian Geological Survey and GEM. And of course it was developed with OpenQuake. Uh, for this analysis, we use uh, exposure models that have been developed at AFID during these last years and um, with a lot of collaboration of graduate students. And for the vulnerability model, we use the functions that were developed by GEM. And of course, we use OpenQuake to put all these together in order to have the risk calculations. And there is another project that uh, I would like to share with you. Right now, we are doing a flood risk analysis in La Estrella, which is a municipality that is near Medellin. And we are doing this with a collaboration of the early warning system of Medellin. They are doing the flood hazard analysis. And we are using OpenQuake to perform the flood risk analysis. So OpenQuake is a tool that can be used for more than just earthquakes. And 2020, it's also a year that I call collaboration. And uh, Peter mentioned before the Trek project is a beautiful project in which uh, I collaborated a little. And this is a training and communication project for earthquake risk assessment. And during this project, we have had the opportunity to train uh, people from very different nationalities on the use of OpenQuake. And also thanks to that project, uh, I have been in touch with other colleagues, professors from other universities, especially from Central America. And we meet every Tuesday morning. Um, we talk about how we can teach seismic risk into uh, our universities and how can we teach, use OpenQuake uh, to teach to our students. So I really enjoy my Tuesday, my Tuesday mornings. So what's next? Well, this is what I see. I'm sure that Everything that will come with this GEM relationship will be very good. Uh, this is what I see now, but I'm sure that many more comes, will co many more things will come. And all of this has been possible because in 2013, I was invited by GEM to be part of the SARA project. So I only have one more slide and it's just a very big thanks to all of the people at GEM. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much. Um, very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I think uh, all of the presentations pre provided uh, quite different perspectives uh, from model development to uh, global applications, local applications, um, trainings, uh, and, and a very wide range of applications to, to communities. So there's, as you can see, quite a, quite a wide variety of of, of uh, applications that OpenQuake is capable of, of, of handling. Um, I think we have, I'd like to show the, uh, the results from the survey that we had at the, uh, at the very beginning. So the first was, uh, what your, this is a survey of, of the uh, participants on the, uh, in the webinar. So we have quite a range of experience. Um, actually, the winning vote there is for beginners. So that's actually, that's great. That means there's uh, quite a number of you who uh, may be keen to uh, join a training program. So we'll, we'll send out some information. And uh, I saw there were also some questions about uh, training. So it's, uh, it's encouraging to know that there are, there are, there are people that are keen uh, to learn more. Um, motivations for using OpenQuake. Uh, here, I guess the winning ones are conducting hazard analysis. Uh, closely behind uh, is risk analysis um, and uh, quite a number of academic research. Not too many teachers, um, but as, as Anna demonstrated, I think that's an area that um, could certainly be, um, could certainly be um, developed further. Uh, 
And then the third one on um, sectors, so mainly academics, but quite a number of industry participants and, uh, and government as well. So uh, a very nice cross section of uh, participants. We had, um, um, I see from the question and answers that uh, most of these were actually answered in line. Um, there was there was one that I thought maybe I could be, um, I might extend to, to uh, Vitor or Marco, uh, and that was in relation to, to OASIS. Um, how does OASIS compare to OpenQuake? Um, and I think, I mean, this could be a very long answer, but maybe, maybe um, starting with uh, Marco, you could, you could um, comment on that. And, uh, and then we'll, um, we can take some other questions. Marco? Uh, thanks, John. I think I answered it actually on the chat, but uh, for what pertains the hazard, uh, Oasis uh, does not have uh, capabilities. Uh, so uh, that, that's, uh, for example, one of the major differences. So OpenQuake is dealing with hazard, and, and whereas in the case of Oasis, uh, uh, that's not, uh, let's say, one of the goals of that software, no, not even a capability. Okay, uh, Vitor, do you want to comment on that from a yeah, risk yeah. point of view? What Marco said is correct. The uh, uh, Oasis doesn't have the as of kernel to basically generate the as of footprints. So what we did at Jam in order to try to create a stronger link between uh, OpenQuake and uh, it was to create this module that converts prints from OpenQuake, damage of vulnerability functions, and even some um, exposure information into the OASIS format. So then um, it is possible to use some of the risk models that were originally developed with OpenQuake now on a platform that allows other types of calculations, like, for example, um, complex uh, insured losses. So uh, the link uh, exists there. We see, we see the advantages on, on both sides. And um, I think we will continue working and trying to improve this link between uh, OpenQuake and Oasis, but not just Oasis. We also did the same exercise. For example, we touched on from AIR and, it's, uh, and we do have activities planned um, uh, for the next uh, years to continue doing this. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Vitor. Yeah, yes, of course, in order, in order to make uh, our models more accessible, particularly to the insurance industry, um, uh, using Oasis and the Oasis uh, LMF format is, is something that we're very definitely um, investing time and energy into. So um, I would like, to, uh, I think I'd like to just ask, I see that unless there are some other questions anybody would like to raise here. Um, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask um, our speakers, particularly uh, Murray, um, Yu Fong, uh, and, and Anna to um, and and Lorenzo to give us just a few words. If you could just wrap, you know, if you could just give us a few words, your final thoughts uh, about the um, your work and the uh, and the future of um, of OpenQuake for your research and applications. So maybe starting with uh, Lorenzo, not to put you on the spot. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Thank you for 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 again to to, to all of you for for the nice presentations. Um, but I think there is one one way, and that way is to keep developing and and uh, keep um, keep uh, uh, collaborating. Um, there is there is a shift on on the next on the next years to 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 move towards the national risk models, as we have seen in Canada, this will happen in Europe as well, with the update of the, of the European hazard model that is right now ongoing. We, we expect that, that such complex models will, will trigger uh, further development into, into, the, into the risk models. And also with the, with the European risk model that is also ongoing right now, I would say that it's important to, to keep the collaboration open, the, the connection and the, the interaction with the develop, developers is essential. And last but not least, I think we sh in, the, in the following year, probably we should also focus into the uh, training webinars 
because people are going to be exposed to, again, to models and they would like to, to, to understand them, to learn, to try to run them on their own and so on. So training and, and webinars, at least, if we continue like this with webinars, it will be a good choice. Thanks, thanks, Laurent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you found from, from your perspective uh, with FM Global, do you have some final comments? Oh, sure. Uh, first, uh, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Jen, especially for making our work much easier. And I do agree that collaboration is the most important part um, of everything. And um, for example, right now, a lot of countries are developing national models. The best scientists from their own countries that work to come up with the best models. Um, but there are some models like Australia model or, or some other models which are really difficult given the tectonic environment, the lack of data. I do think in the future, even for the national models, um, input from the scientists of all, all over the world should be added to make the model consent to make a consensus model, which I mean otherwise otherwise different people have different opinion and make the work everywhere difficult. And another thought I have is that um, it's also important to share uh, for I know Jam has been making everything uh, public, trying to make it public. I mean, share between different sectors, such as industry and government, industry and academic is also important. We are trying to share what we have de developed. Uh, for example, in the future, we are going to put our risk map online and we try to share our China model with, with, with through through Jam platform, um, so so that's my yeah, main main thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yufeng. Um, uh, turning to um, to Murray. Murray, do you have a couple of quick thoughts you can leave us with? And again, thank you, John, and and, uh, and everyone at Jam. Uh, I guess uh, just a, a closing thought. I'll be very quick. Is uh, you know, we're with the adoption of Sendai at local scales by municipal governments, uh, there, there is a, a wave of change happening on the ground right now uh, in the context of urban planning. And we're really being pushed to generate metrics that are relevant and useful to practitioners uh, for the whole life cycle of planning. And I think uh, this, uh, to, to really respond to this need, as Vitor encouraged us, we, we need to be proactive and anticipating what those needs and requirements are. And, and I think finally, we can't do this alone. Uh, no one organization can do this alone. So uh, echoing other people's comments, uh, it really hinges on, on uh, the trusted collaboration networks that uh, Jem has helped establish. So we, we thank you for that. Thanks, Murray. Anna, I'll let you have the final word. I'm always the last one here. <laughs> uh, well, I think all of them have said what, what I feel. So I will just point out the, the key words, which is collaborations. Uh, I am just an example of how I am here right now because of the collaboration with so many people, so many institutions. Uh, you you found say something very important, which is sharing the information. Uh, for example, for a country like Colombia, it's very important that the, everything that is produced can be used by others. So uh, uh, me that I'm working at a university is very important that my work and whatever we do is shared with the community. Uh, training, training is for me is a key issue. And as Lorraine should say, now we have the opportunity to do training with webinars. Uh, there's so many things, uh, the website that now you can do the training on your own. So I will encourage the people to not be afraid of open quick. Uh, you can really learn open quick. It's not that difficult, really. And if it's difficult, you just go and ask to the people because the people at GEM is always open to answer any questions. So that's very important. Uh, networking, actually. If without networking, uh, I'm sure I wouldn't be here. And many of the networking that I have now is thanks to this initial collaboration with Jim. Like for example, you saw that Mori came to Colombia and then Victor and Kata, and then I go to Italy and every, all of this, it's very, very important. 
Um, and the final comment will be that we will try, we should try to establish a very close collaboration with the local institutions. So we can really do something that will uh, improve uh, the knowledge and the resilience to earthquakes in our region. That's all. Uh, I'd like to thank, if everybody can still hear me, uh, I just want to give a final thank you to everyone who participated, particularly to our, our panelists for their great presentations and, uh, and to all of you for, for joining us for the last hour and a half. Thank you very much. Have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, we'll see you all sometime soon. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.